week. Now you're going to get to hear from Colonel, Army Colonel, Alan West, um, an inspiration American patriot. And uh, Colonel, come up here and bless us, please. All right, thanks, Anton, and thank you, Donna, and thank you, each and every one of you, for taking the time to come out this morning and, and to be on time. I was checking the door, nobody was late, so no one has to do push ups today. But uh, obviously, I don't know, Donna, were, were y'all kind of hitting rock bottom? That's why y'all had me here to, 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 to fill in or, or whatever. So the purpose of this morning is not for me to stand up here and blow over you. The purpose for this morning is for us to have a really good, intense conversation. And I hope that we can learn from what we're going to share this morning because we're at a critical time right now in the United States of America. And how many of you have ever had this little scenario, this little vignette play out? Where you go up to one of your brothers and sisters in Christ and you say, hey, you know what? You know, there's an important election coming up and, you know, are you going to get involved? What are you going to do? Hey, brother, you know. I'm just sitting around here waiting for the Lord to come back. You know, I ain't got time for all that politics and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, I, you know, it, it, it ain't going to help a public Democrat. It don't matter. It, it's all about Jesus. And, and Jesus is going to come back and take care of everything. How do you deal with a person that thinks that way? How do you deal with the people that call themselves Christians, but yet, for whatever reason, they don't want to get involved in this thing called the political envir environment or atmosphere here in the United States of America. It was a Greek guy, maybe some of y'all might know his name. His name was Plato. And he had this saying. He said, one of the penalties for refusing to participate in politics is that you shall be governed by your inferiors. So what I want to do is, is talk to you, coming first and foremost from Matthew chapter 22, Starting at verse 15. Kind of sets the stage for today. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent the disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one. For you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? See, they figured they got it. But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this they said to him caesar's then he said to them then render to caesar the things that are caesar's and to god the things that are god's i'd like to to to, to get into your mindset and ask this question and like i said this is an open discussion what do we render unto caesar I think that's a very important question for Christians to ask themselves today. And when I'm talking about Caesar, I'm talking about govern, governance. How do we make ourselves rendered unto him? You read in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, this, where it says, each, every person, is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those who which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing 
For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on those who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rules or service of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom is honor. Now the interesting thing is that Paul is writing this letter to the Romans, and guess who was the emperor at that time? Nero. Nero. <laughs> Not exactly a stable person. And you think about the persecution that was coming up against Christians at the time, but yet Paul is saying to be subject to the government. But think about last night, the person that we honor. It's an incredible story. How the government made a decision. The government made a law. The government made a mandate. It was called the contraception mandate as part of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. And here's a Christian businessman who stood up and said, I ain't down with that. Now, some would come back and say, hey, ho, ho, time out on the court there, Mr. Green. If I go to the Bible, it says that you're supposed to render unto Caesar what is Caesar. If I go to the Bible and I read here in Romans 13, 1 through 7, you're supposed to be subject to the government. And there is the incredible dilemma. There is the incredible juxtaposition for us as Christians to understand. Is that what Paul is talking about, what Jesus is talking about, is for Christians to be subject to righteous governments and good governments. Because what we have to come to understand in our walk, in our daily lives, that we have to be rooted in our fundamental principles and beliefs. But once you start to establish a government, once you start to establish a belief that is contrary to your faithfulness, then you are not to have to be subject to it. Think about this. And this is what came to me when I was running this morning at 06. <laughs> I'm running, I'm thinking, you know what? You know, Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. He showed that Daenerys and it had the inscription. But when they were doing that monkey business in his father's house, Jesus went sideways. Because they were not rendering the right honor. They were not rendering the right respect in his father's house. And that's what we have to come to understand. Is that when you talk about the temple that was being defiled by the money changers or whatever, each and every one of us, our body is a temple. And if government, if man and mandates and whatever send down laws that are defiling our temple, then we are supposed to stand up in objection to that. But in standing up in objection to that, there's a right way of doing it. And that's what he's talking about here. That you can do it in a good and rightful and respectful way that still shows that you are subject to government. I mean, that's what Mr. Green did. When Mr. Green said, hey, President Obama, first of all, I did build this business. I mean, we, you know, my family did. Yeah. But the other thing is that this business is part of me. This is an extension of my faith. And for you to come down and say that I must do this, that's not the righteous governance. And how interesting it is that now today Christians must go before the highest courts in the land mm -hmm. to stand up for their faith. Mm -hmm. And see, that's not being disrespectful. I don't think that Paul will come back and say you're not being subject to the government. You're doing exactly what God will call you to do. is to stand up and challenge unrighteous governance. Because the most important thing you have to realize is that those nine people in the black robes there on the Supreme Court, you're not going to stand before them in eternity. You're going to stand before him. And you got to want to hear those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And think about Jack Phillips. How many people here know who Jack Phillips is? Jack Phillips? Jack Phillips? Jack Phillips? 
See, this is what I'm talking about. And I'm not chastising. But I got to kind of hit you in the back pocket. Jack Phillips is the baker from Colorado. Masterpiece oh. of baker. That name should be preeminent in every one of our minds. Jack Phillips is a man that says, you know, here I have a business. My business is an extension of my values. I will be happy to serve anyone because Christ calls us to love everyone. But when you tell me that I must participate in something, that is contrary to my principles and my values and my beliefs as laid down in this book. I can't abide by that. And how interesting it was that he was subject to government. He allowed himself to be drugged to the entire court system all up to the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court. And he continued to stand upon God's word and what he believed in. And an incredible decision, seven to two, the Supreme Court sided with him. Because your first, your very first constitutional right is what? Freedom of religion and the free exercise thereof. And so what we have to come to understand as Christians, is that in this incredible political atmosphere and what we in where we find ourselves, is that we have to be grounded, we have to be rooted in what we believe. We have to study and understand this book of the law. Remember how I talked about in Joshua chapter one, five through nine, when Joshua took over the great horde and God told him, This book of the law, you shall meditate upon it day and night, you shall not turn from it from the right to the left. But let me tell you something else. Here's another book of the law that we need to study upon to make sure that we have righteous governance. And when people sit back and say that America is not a Christian nation, you say, okay, but America does have a Judeo-Christian faith heritage. I want you to think about this. October the 31st. It ain't just about trick or treat, smell my feet, give me something good to eat. You know, that's what we would say when we were kids, okay? But isn't it a shame now the kids can't even walk around and do trick or treat? They got to go to churches and they got to have it out of trunks. I mean, that's how deplorable our society has become. But the interesting thing about October 31st, here's another incredible significance. Because it was October the 31st of 1517 when a simple Germanic monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed a document on the wall of the church in Wittenberg in Germany, the not five theses. And when you talk about the relationship between Christianity and government, that's where it got started 501 years ago, this October the 31st. Why? Because Martin Luther said that every person has a right to have a personal relationship with their Heavenly Father, with their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You don't have to go through a pope. You don't have to go through a bishop. You don't have to go through any other entity that is established above you. You have that right. And then it was a few years later, a couple of few centuries, there was an English political philosopher by the name of John Locke who said that if man had the right to go straight to God for his personal salvation, then guess what? It is only natural that all of his rights come from that exact same sovereign God. And John Locke created a thing called natural rights theory. That said, your life, your liberty, and your property were endowed to you from your creator. Then a few hundred years later, a simple man from Virginia, when this great nation was being put forth and when this great nation was established, he wrote that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So when people come back and say, you know, America is not this Christian nation, you have to come back and say, but America has a Judeo-Christian faith heritage. As a matter of fact, a good friend of mine by the name of Dave Barton, he don't have this little simple pamphlet. He wrote about it here. America's Godly Heritage. Because what is happening here in the United States of America is too often Christians aren't studying and understanding the verses in the Bible. 
But yet you have people that will come back and say, well, let, let me tell you what, you Christians. It says here that you're supposed to be subject to government. That means that you're just supposed to do what we say to do. You're supposed to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Because sometimes the other side, the other people, they'll read the Bible too. How interesting it is that in the Bible, I think it's right, there, there's a verse that says, from those, now I'm going to say, where it has to go, uh, for those who much is given, much is required. Am I right? right? You ever heard of that line from a guy by the name of Karl Marx? Who says, from each according to his ability, to each according to their needs. See, we got to be careful to make sure that people aren't taking biblical verses and they're using them for their own political gain. Angela and I once attended uh, an event here in Dallas, and this whole thing about illegal immigration came up, and a woman from the audience stood up and said, Christians should be allowing anyone to come into the United States of America, because that's what a compassionate Christian does. Okay. Well, I just kind of looked over here into the, you know, the rule of law <laughs> that we are supposed to live under, and it talks about sovereignty. It talks about immigration and who's responsible for it. And so what you have to come to understand is don't allow someone to use your faith against you. And then also don't allow someone to pin you and your faith into a pigeonhole so that you don't know what to do. Jack Phillips, Steve Green, they're great examples of how Christians are supposed to be subject to government. We're supposed to be subject to righteous government. It says over here in uh, 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 to 14. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. And act as free men and do not use freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. See, that's what Peter's saying here is that don't go out and try to use your Christian faith as a means by which you cover things that you want to have for your own personal liking. But if you are doing good and standing up to understand righteous governance, you will be blessed by God. I mean, I mean, Hobby Lobby store is everywhere now. <laughs> and Jack Phillips, his business is going to thrive because God rewarded him. But I want to now start really asking y'all some tough questions. Should Christians run for political office? Yes. 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 Sure. Now, how should Christian govern when they're in political office? Should they govern by the Bible or should they govern by the rule of law? Both. 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 Bible comes first. The rule of law. It is inconsistent with the Bible. You have to speak your conscience and be true to God, not to the government. I think it's totally opposite. Anyone else? How do you how how does a Christian elected official go? Yes, ma'am. Well, the Word of God also teaches us that we are ambassadors of another kingdom. So there's law, and then there's kingdom law, and kingdom law is the Word of God, and its principles are what governs. It's who we are. We are ambassadors. It's not something that we do. So to me, I believe that your center core of who God has created you in a new birth experience is going to affect how you make decisions in your life and how you um, how you would govern according to righteousness. Absolutely. Anyone else? Gary uh, Kinder for 38 years always said what the, if the government condones what the Bible condemns, you go with the Bible. There you go. You have to. Anyone else? Would I mean, you ever do anything that disobeys any 
anything that God wants us to do. I mean, it's that reconciliation that you have to really walk a thin line with. Because one of the key things is that you don't want anyone to believe that you're being a theocrat. I mean, that's what Sharia law and everything is about, when people are standing there and they're trying to govern using the Quran. But that's why we do have a constitution. And the important thing about our constitution, it talks about those individual rights and freedoms. And we have to understand that those individual rights and freedoms, they don't come from man. They come from a creator. Okay, here's a, here's a really big trivia question. <laughs> See if anyone can get this one. John Locke, when he wrote about natural rights theory, said it was life, liberty, and property. And Donna, you can't answer because you already know. Life, liberty, and property <clears throat> were those inalienable rights on the natural rights theory. When Thomas Jefferson, who studied John Locke, wrote in the Declaration of Independence, he did not say life, liberty, and property. He said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why did Thomas Jefferson not write down life, liberty, and property in our Declaration of Independence? Anyone want to take a stab? Pursuit of happiness will have property in it, but it's not the only thing. Close, okay. as Lee Corso would say. Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> property can be taken away, but your pursuit of happiness cannot. Property can be taken away, but pursuit of happiness cannot. Closer. <laughs> Think about this. Who was the person in charge of supervising the writing of the Declaration of Independence? Oh, man. Come on. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was in charge of supervising the writing of the Declaration of Independence. What state was Benjamin Franklin from? <laughs> Who wrote the Declaration of Independence? What state was Thomas Jefferson from? Virginia. What was the difference at that time between Pennsylvania and Virginia? Slavery. Benjamin Franklin told Thomas Jefferson to strike the word property because, that's right, slavery. Benjamin Franklin did not want anyone in America to believe that it was an inalienable right to own another person. <coughs> And so, therefore, it was written pursuit of happiness. Hmm. Because slavery is not consistent right. with a Judeo-Christian faith heritage. And see, that's the power. When you understand this book of the law that Moses was given, that Joshua fought, in the and this book of the law that you're given, that men wrote. But these men who gave us this book of the law, they based it upon biblical principles. But the thing today, as our founding fathers realized, is that man, men and women, acting in their own self-interest, will sometimes eschew those fundamental <clears throat> beliefs, principles, and values that we have here in the United States of America that established this great nation. General? The, <clears throat> the Constitution was probably the best document ever written and the worst document ever written. And it, and it was the worst document ever written because it didn't address slavery, it didn't address the Indian problem, and it didn't address the problem of women voting. And those things were left loose, saying our deliberative body, the Congress, can solve all those problems later. But to unite the country now, we just can't bring those up because we're going to be too split. No, you're absolutely right. And, and that's why they have the system of amendments. Because again, what does it say in the preamble of the Constitution of the United States of America? A more perfect union. Not a perfect union, but a more perfect union. Something that we're working and we're striving toward. Just the same as your Christian faith. Every single day you're working to become a better and more perfect Christian and an example of him. That's why there's an incredible intricate relationship. But if you don't understand and we forget that relationship, then we will be a nation that falls asunder. See, one of the things we have to realize a lot of times, you know, God can use anybody for his people. Give me three examples of God using certain people in the Old Testament for the children of Israel. Three very distinct examples. 
Rahab. I got even better than that. Rahab. How about Cyrus? Oh, yeah. How about Xerxes? Yeah. Yeah. How about Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. Those were not Jews. Those were not his people, but yet he used them in government for his people's good. And that's what we have to seek out and understand. That sometimes God can bring someone for such a time as this, as it says, but because of the faith of the people, then the leader will work to respect the faith of the people. Think about two folks in the Old Testament that were elevated to incredible positions in government that weren't Jewish. Give me one. Joseph. Joseph, Joseph and, okay. and Daniel. Think about the influence that they had on the leaders at that time. And that's why I think it's so important for, as it says in Matthew chapter 5, for let your light so shine, for us to be in elected office. For us to show that we can reconcile this thing called the rule of the law and this book of the law. We can reconcile and bring America back to a Judeo-Christian faith heritage, which it was established upon, without disrupting what we have in the world. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it was an interesting piece that was written here. Who is it? How many folks here know who Tim Keller is? Tim Keller, pastor up in New York. He wrote a piece in the uh, New York Times, 29 September 2018. And this is what the title was basically about. Tim Keller warns Christians not to assign the church a political party. Let me repeat that. Tim Keller warns Christians not to assign the church a political party. <clears throat> For example, following both the Bible and the early church, Christians should be committed to racial justice and the poor, but also to the understanding that sex is only for marriage and for nurturing families. One of those views seems liberal, the other looks oppressively conservative. The historical Christian positions on social issues do not fit into contemporary political alignments. Oh. You, want, you know, I want to repeat that again? <coughs> okay, let me repeat that again because, you know, I, since I'm not a Marine, I speak a little faster. <laughs> <laughs> One of those views, hey, look, I love Marines. My older brother was a Marine. I spent three years on exchange at Camp Lejeune. I had to teach him math. But anyhow, <laughs> one of those views, one of those views seems liberal. And the other looks oppressively conservative. The historical Christian positions on social issues do not fit into contemporary political alignments. Redeemer Presbyterian Church, that's what it is. It said the Bible shows believers as holding important positions in pagan governments, like I said, David and Joseph. But Christians should be involved politically as a way of loving our neighbors, whether they believe as we do or not. This Christian press a pastor writing in the New York Times. And I, I read a lot of the comments because it's always interesting when you read the comments. Mm -hmm. And there were people that you could tell which leaning they were on. And they were supporting his position saying Christians need to shut up and stop trying to tell people how to live their lives. Where do we fit in in society today as Christians? Should we just take this definition of being <coughs> subjects? We have to weigh in for the Lord and we, we and it's obvious if you look at the platforms of the two parties we've got which party is on the Lord's side and which party isn't. Ah, uh, but see, Pastor Keller would say that's wrong. That ain't wrong. Because you just decide. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of respect. He's a two star and I'm just a lieutenant colonel, so yes, sir. <laughs> you say so. But no, but, 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 but this is, I mean, we laugh. But this is a prominent Christian pastor who wrote that in an op ed in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> I 
So what do you think people that are reading the New York Times, pits, you know, in this editorial page, they see? See? Here's one of your own pastors saying that you got no business getting involved in marriage or killing unborn babies because your historical Christian <clears throat> positions on social issues do not fit into contemporary political alignments. This is, this is the conflict that we have going on within the Christian church. This is why you see so many Christian denominations splitting up. Because there are people that say, you know, you know, it's the culture. Got to do what the culture says. We want to be cool. We want to be accepted. We, you know. But is that what God calls us to be? I think there's a, a, a place in, in the Bible where it says that you're either hot or cold. Mm -hmm. If you're lukewarm, he's going to spew you from his mouth. So we need to figure out how we will continue to be hot for the Lord. And how we will continue to challenge the issues of the day. Because when you talk about illegal immigration, we're all compassionate. But we're also a nation of laws. Mm -hmm. If we're not a nation of laws, then we have anarchy. And what happens in anarchy? When you talk about wealth redistribution, and people are very good at using verses from the Bible to say that you need to give it up. But then if I'm right, it goes back over to uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10, where it says this. about getting out there and like doing something. It says, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat. See, I, I, I believe that we should be out there helping our friends. I believe that we should be out there helping the neighbors. I tell people so often that I believe in a safety net. But when you allow a safety net to become a hammock, it's contrary to what God would have us do and believe. Because, as my mom would say, self-esteem only comes from doing esteemable things. And truthfully, when you think about it, when you become so dependent upon the government for your everyday subsistence in life, then the government with a little g replaces God with a big g. Secular humanism is something that we face. And how can you align yourselves with secular humanism? Now, I, I'm, I'm, it's the only thing political party related that I'll say. But if I was standing here with Pastor Tim Keller, I would remind him of what happened at a certain political party convention in Charlotte, North Carolina in 2012. When they removed the reference of God out of their party platform. And you can go back and look at the video. I mean, I, I'm not making this up. But when they had to vote to put God back into the platform of that party, they booed. Now, I, I think the Christians should be able to evaluate positions on their own. I think the Christians should stand on principles and values and then seek those people that align with those principles and values. You know, I was in the Congressional Bible study. There were some very good folks that were on the other side of the aisle they were members of the members Bible study. <laughs> they ain't there no more though. I wonder why. Because their values and their principles were no longer consistent with the organization that they were with. But how do we reconcile ourselves as Christians today in the United States of America when we have leaders in our church that are saying that you cannot assign your beliefs to any certain political party. When, when you have leaders who say Christian positions on social issues do not fit into contemporary political alignments. What would you say if Tim Keller was standing here right now? What would you say to him? Y'all wouldn't say nothing? <laughs> but this is a very popular pastor. 
written many books, has an incredibly large congregation. The, the founder of Redeemer Presbyterian Church. Yes, ma'am. Continue. It's kind of the frog in the pot syndrome. I think there are some who profess the Lord, but uh, maybe lack the courage to stand up for him, even leaders. I have a cousin who is a uh, Presbyterian minister. And um, I finally told my husband on Facebook, I just couldn't take it anymore. She was so adamant for the extreme left. And her um, uncle uh, reached out to her and said, Renee, what has happened to you? I, you say you're a Christian and you're just spewing this hatred. And um, of course all of her buddies rallied and he was now being victimized on social media. But it just pains me to see those who profess the Lord and don't seem to love him or his people. Keller argued that believers can and perhaps should be active in politics, but they should not identify the Christian church or faith with a political party as the only Christian one. The preacher said that by assigning the church a political party, one runs the risk of legitimizing the arguments of skeptics that say that religion is just another political machine. Another reason, another reason not to align the Christian faith with one party is that most political positions, you ready for this? Most political positions are not matters of biblical command, but of practical wisdom. This does not mean that the church can never speak on social, economic, and political realities, because the Bible often does, he wrote. This is the problem that we have in our faith. Because for whatever reason, we're trying to massage it, Anton, so that we're acceptable to everybody and folks like us. And, you know, we're, we're, we're part of a mainstream way. I don't, I, don't, Go. I don't think we were promised that. I mean, if Jesus suffered at the hands of the government for doing nothing, what makes us think that we wouldn't suffer the same? And we're supposed to share in his sufferings. So if we're to share in sufferings, and we're lukewarm because we don't want to, I mean, we're too worried of losing our status or our stature or whatever. How is that at all walking in his shoes? Ma'am? Oh, I had a friend that uh, professed to be a Christian and uh, he was never professing anything about his Christianity, anyone that I could ever see. And I asked him one day, I said, how many people do you know that you work with no, you are a Christian. And he said, well, I don't know. I said, how, what do you mean you don't know? He said, well, I don't know. I don't talk about it. I said, why don't you talk about it? He said, because I'm afraid it might cause some issues at work. And I said, let me tell you something. If you don't honor your God, he's not going to honor you. And if you don't let people know what you stand for, God's not going to be standing up for you either. Yes, ma'am. I personally think that the whole problem, and this is just, you know, my personal opinion is that it separates us into two categories. People who want Christianity to be Christianity to be I need a savior. Everybody wants a saving savior. Not everybody wants Lord. Lord it's in your business. Lord is in the word. Lord says this is not good, don't do this. And there are more than ten commandments. Every imperative statement in the Bible. Don't do this. Do this are commands. They're set there for our, for our good, for his glory. And there are two types of, of Christians. One is somebody who I really think believes in embracing God as Lord and allowing him to conform us to his image. And the others want a social gospel. And that's the division that we face. You know, it's interesting because, and I'll come over to you now, because I think the whole thing about separation of church and state has gotten to, to the point because we really as a Christian body didn't understand, don't understand what separation of church and state really means. You know, I was speaking at the University of Miami to a, a group of uh, political science students, juniors and seniors. University of Miami is pretty, you know, highly intellectual place. 
I mean, Alan West could not get into the University of Miami unless I was playing football. But, but the, the interesting thing was this. I'm standing here and I'm talking about government and governance and I'm talking about faith heritage. And a young lady came up and asked me, well, you know, don't you think that you're, you're, you're violating the separation of church and state? And I'm like, okay, this is going to be fun. <laughs> This young lady, uh, uh, upperclassman in political science at the University of Miami. Where you find that? She said, "What's well, in the Declaration of Independence?" I said, eh. <laughs> Next try. Well, she said, "Well, it must be in the Constitution." Eh. Keep going. And so I finally had to explain to them that you know Thomas Jefferson wrote this in the Danbury to the Danbury Baptist Convention. And what Thomas Jefferson did not want to have happen when he wrote about separation of church and state, it was an idea, it was a principle. He did not want this country to have a head of state who was also the head of church. Because of the example of who? King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII, who had established the Church of England. And why did King Henry VIII establish the Church of England? He established the Church of England because he wanted a divorce. And the Catholic Church wouldn't give it to him. <laughs> so he said, okay, I'll make up my own church. <laughs> and I'll make all the rules thereof. And then all of a sudden, if you did not make yourself subject to the king's church, the church of man, then you were persecuted and prosecuted. And that's why people fled and came here. And that's why your very first right, individual right, in the Bill of Rights, is your freedom of religion. But if Thomas Jefferson were walking today with those people that received his letter, Mary Baptist, he would say, we've come right back to violate this. Because when you have a government that is making law that tells you that, bam, your faith does not extend past what we define as your freedom of worship, not freedom of religion. And we will define what is your space to worship in. That's where we are in America. Okay, it's okay that you believe in Christian stuff, but you, you know, once you go outside these doors here, Preston World Country Club, can't talk about them. We'll let you come in here and do whatever you want. It has nothing to do in the greater sphere of governance. That is an incredible tipping point. Because all of a sudden, if we get to the point in America where we don't believe that our nailing of a rice are endowed to us from a creator, then who is the grantor of those nailing of rights? And then who can then be the taker of those nailing of rights? The leader of the government. All right, right here, ma'am, then I'll come to you, Mr. Foster. It's simply a matter of perspective. Are we looking at the Bible through the lens of the world, or are we looking at the world through the lens of the Bible? Which one do you think we should do? <laughs> Got something back about your new book. Oh, stop. This is not paid political announcements about a book. Yeah, Y'all can say, I got a book out there, Hum Hum DDD, about Texas and how important it is to the nation. But nothing is more important than God for our nation. That's right. Right. Yep. And that's the thing that we must come to understand that's the thing that we must stand up and fight for and that's the thing that we must respectfully challenge like we saw Steve Green do like we saw Jack Phillips do like we need to be doing every single day of our lives when you look at and I tell people the most important elected position in the United States of America it's not president it's not senator it's not congressman it's not governor it's not that gum, you know, state representative, the most important elected position in the United States of America is school board. You, you see, you knew that because we talk about that a lot. But it's school board. Because it is all about how we're shaping the minds of future generations. And if we're not, well, I mean, just talking about these basics. A Christian education is fundamental to an education that understands the United States of America. We don't teach civics anymore. Mm -hmm. History is and whatever we want. I mean, I stood before the Dallas City Council the day that they tore down Robert E. Lee statue. It's incredible. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. There's a place in Atlanta, Georgia called Stone Mountain. Y'all know about Stone Mountain? Yeah. On the face of Stone Mountain, you got Robert E. Lee, you got Jefferson Davis, you got, uh, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Stonewall Jackson? Jackson. They, they never offended me. They existed. They never did anything to me. 
But see, you're not careful. People will do just the same as the Taliban did <coughs> in Afghanistan when they were established themselves in the government. They tore down all the statues of everything that existed before they came into power, just the same as ISIS. Tore down all of the Christian monuments and relics for some almost 1,600 years. Oh, had always had a Christian bell ringing on Sunday. When ISIS came and took over, it did. Now, were people supposed to make themselves subject to that type of government, or do we recognize it as being tyranny? That's the important question that Christians have to ask. And you're right, ma'am. How do you look at the world? Which lens are you using? If you're using the lens of the world, you're going to have blurred vision. But if you use the lens of God, you will see clearly. But yet, think about in our schools and our colleges and universities, no one is teaching that truth is an objective thing. I mean, as a matter of fact, I mean, y'all know about common core math. I mean, two plus two can equal anything that you want. And as long as you're able to justify how you got to two plus two equals six, then you get a passing grade. But I just wanted to let you know that if there's ever a kid that is out there to believe 2 plus 2 equals 6 grows up to become an engineer, I would never go across the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the greatest truths that we have in our life are contained right here in the Bible. And I believe that when you see the problems that we have with our young people, the opioid crisis, the suicides and everything, it's because they're looking for something to fill that God-shaped hole in their heart. But if we have a system of governance that tells us that we cannot deal with those things from a, a, a Christian or a godly perspective with a godly lens, when we have ministers in our own church that are saying that our perspective and our view is antiquated for today's contemporary society, then we're losing the salt that we're supposed to be. Yes, sir, back here. You can shout. Okay. Uh, I think, in regard to what you're saying, that there is a uh, ruling segment of American society that's trying to take over America, and they have been for a long time, and it includes Bezos and Zuckerberg and the Clintons and and Hollywood and television and um, it's a filthy rich element of society that lives completely different lives than any of us in this room do. <clears throat> now, stay with me, please. I'm with you. If, I, I got five minutes, but I'm with you. If uh, <laughs> If you want to take over America, what you want to do is you want to silence free speech and you want to re-educate America. Now, re-educating America has been going on for, in my estimation, 25, 30 years. And, uh, uh, and to stop free speech, and, and what they well, what they've done in re-educating America, they've made us think things are wrong that we always have known are right that are that are totally different than the way any of us thought or grew up. And now we really can't say anything about it because if you say anything about it, what you see is wrong. You're attacked. You're vilified on social media. I know a little bit about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're shut down in public. Um, yeah, but let me. Let, 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 but but I, I'm not trying to cut you off. But I, I got to close on time. If I'm starting on time, I have to close on time. But if you're a Christian, if you're serving our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the scourge that he went through 
and the disparagement, the denigration, being spat upon, nailed to a cross, how less are you willing to sacrifice and to stand up? If you truly believe in the person that you say that you believe in. And see, that is, to me, the most important thing. I, I know that next week maybe y'all say, what are the three takeaways? One of the three takeaways is that you must believe, as it says in Isaiah 54 and 17, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. Because that's the heritage of those who love the Lord. Because what I see happening is that too often Christians are told that you're not nice, you're not kind, you're not this, you're not that. You're really the haters. We're not the haters. We love everyone. But there are actions that we don't love. And we got to stand on principle and we have to stand on belief and we have to call that out. We have to be objective in who and what we are professing to be and also what we are calling out. And too often we don't do that very well. And we have to, second thing I would say, which lens do you look at the world through? Do you look at the world through the lens that Hollywood elites or whoever are telling you that you should look through? Or do you look through the lens of this book that as Joshua was told, to meditate upon it day and night, do not turn from it from the right or to the left. And the third thing, point that I would like to, to leave you with is this. You're called to be subject, not just to government, but to righteous government. You're called to honor and give due honor and respect to those who have earned the due honor and respect. If there is something, as Mr. Oh, shoot, Terry, because you spelled weird, I had to think about it. <laughs> I was going to say Terry. But as Mr. Terry said, how do you reconcile between these two incredible books? This is the longest running book of truth. And this book contains the principles of guidance for the longest running constitutional republic that the world has ever known. But this book could not exist without this book. And we must understand that. And you must teach these things to your children. Angela and I struggle with that with our, our daughters. We got to constantly be engaged. We have to constantly. It's, it's a cultural fight out there. I mean, because the devil is out there trying to take those souls. Because what? The devil wants to take away the future of the United States of America. And by taking away the future of America, he has to go after our children and grandchildren. We gotta fight for them. Mm -hmm. And the best way to fight for our children and grandchildren is to make sure that you pray to the Lord to be in their hearts and souls. Sometimes, as kids, they wanna to touch something that's hot. They gotta learn that it is hot. Remember the prodigal son. Our father welcomes us back. And I think that America is going through these trials and tribulations because there's something greater that he wants us to be, that more perfect union that we still have not attained. But we will never be that diamond that he wants unless we're not the salt and we're not the light. This is not how we maintain ourselves as the salt and the light. We cannot have those type of leaders. Okay, sir, so real quick, because I got an order for the general. He's got to have a last okay. minute. Oh, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to say, in, a, in another way, that free speech is taken away from us now by certain ones of these elites is by getting you fired from your job if you say something that they don't like or they don't want. So when they re-educate us, when they take away our freedom of speech, they have one more thing that they need to do, and that is they need to take away our guns. And then we have to even rely on them for protection. We can't protect ourselves anymore. So. All right. And being a good paratrooper, the last word goes to Major General Vernon Lewis. Let, let, me, let me say this real quick about Major General Vernon Lewis, something that maybe you all don't know. The man sitting here before us, 
post-World War II holds the record for being the youngest person ever to be promoted to two-star general in the history of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Sir Berea, Sir Vietnam, he's an incredible man. He's an incredible Christian. So God bless you, sir. Thank you all. Hey, Alan, don't go away. Tell them what the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says. Uh, the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says very simply, and, and let me read it because I don't want to paraphrase and get something wrong because then I'll have to do push-ups. One on. Okay, number 10. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Okay, I want to tell you a feel-good story uh, right quick. Steve Green and I belong to an organization that works to get the Christians out to vote. Not for the Republicans or the Democrats, but to vote their biblical values. And it's been effective. It was effective in 2016, and we're doing it even bigger right now. But our organization also recognizes that there are three big cancers on our culture today that belong to the Supreme Court. Prayer in schools, abortions, and same-sex marriages. So we're going to set about getting back in the court system with conservative judges and get back in front of the Supreme Court if necessary and getting those reversed and handed to the states. And we're creating a task force to do that. And Alan, you know who's in that? You. David Barton. David Barton's in that. Kelly Shackelford's on it. John Graves is on it. And Phil King is on it. And Mark Nuttall is on it, and Randy Forrest is on it, and Matt Staver is on it, and Les Wallnow is on it. You could pick nine bigger, influential, powerful Christians if you wanted to. And we're going to get back in here, and we're going to fund this thing with a few million bucks. And we're going to get back in front of this, what they're going to call a conservative Supreme Court, and see if they're real constitutionalists, and they'll read the Tenth Amendment, because they court is not supposed to make law and those three things are the law of the land all from the supreme court two of them by one vote so we're going to see if we can reverse it i thought y'all might like to know that yeah, you went in as an enlisted man too i understand is that correct as a sergeant wow well, <laughs> That's what I mean. You started as a private. What about a second lieutenant general. and, you know, I was all that stuff. <laughs> oh, well, you're a blessing. That's why you're in our Hall of Fame. And uh, Colonel West, outstanding. As usual. As usual. You know, when you talk about um, the rule of law breaking down and anarchy resulting, and people think it can't happen here. It can happen here. 1917, my father's family um, in Russia, which is now Belarus, had a 50,000 acre farm. And the Bolsheviks showed up with machine guns and took everything that they had, every stick of food, furniture, livestock, gave them a collective farm, essentially turned them into slaves. And my dad, my grandfather, and my uncle were the only three out of 18 that could get out. So it can happen here. Pray for this nation. We pray weekly for this nation. And pray for godly leaders. I mailed President Trump a letter, got a nice one back from him. I said, your life verse ought to be Psalm 56.5, which says, All day long they twist my words and plot my demise. <laughs> So he and David had, uh, had it in common. Well, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. This whole weekend has been a blessing, and I am so grateful for patriots, men like Colonel West and General Lewis and the Green family and just godly people rising up in culture-changing industries, becoming leaders and affecting that cause for Christ. 
I pray for our nation, Lord. I pray for our president. I lift him up for wisdom. Thank you for the uh, great influence that Pastor Robert Jeffress has on him uh, almost on a, a weekly, monthly basis. He's with him. And I just pray that you would impart that wisdom because I know he's a new believer. And I ask that you would bless him. Bless him mightily. He could be a Jehu for this country and turn it back to you. And I thank you for all the people here today. Bless them. Bless their health. Bless their families, their businesses. And let them be roaring lambs for you. And I pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Great day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>